Hi, I'm Corey Jones and I'm from Jones Technical Institute and today we're going to talk about HVAC refrigerant flow. To understand how a system works and to troubleshoot it, it's important to understand what's happening inside. To understand what's happening inside, it's tough to see, so we will start out by diagramming it on the board today. Our components, we're going to stick with the basic components of an AC system. When we look at the components, we have them labeled in a standard order of understanding, but we're going to follow the understanding a little differently. Instead of starting with A today, we're going to start with D. Any point in a flow, we can look at what is happening. But the flow begins at D, which is our compressor. Our compressor is what takes refrigerant in a vapor state and creates the flow. What we will see coming out of here is a high pressure vaporized refrigerant. So I'm going to use red because if we was to put our hand on this line, it would actually be hot. It would literally burn us. So at that point, we're going to use red dots to show what's coming out of here. If I was to hook up an AC gauge to this, this would be running around 220 PSI. If I was to check the temperature of it, it would be around 170 degree boiling point. It would be very warm here. As it comes out of our compressor, it is going to work its way to our second component, which is E. And at that point is our condenser. Just like the name sounds, our condenser is a simple device that utilizes airflow, the natural movement of a vehicle's airflow most of the time, to take BTUs out of the refrigerant and convert that vapor to a liquid, hence condensing it. So when this initially comes in, it is what would be called a high pressure superheated vapor. All superheated means is the temperature is actually up over the boiling point of the refrigerant. So step one in the condenser is the air flows past the tubes and the fins. At that point, the refrigerant will come down to what is known as saturation temperature. And what we will literally start seeing happen is this refrigerant is going to condense into a liquid. As it condenses, you will have vapor and liquid combined together, termed as a saturated mixture. Inside the condenser, it's easy to tell when this saturated mixture begins. Because what will happen inside of here is you will see it reach a stable temperature. When that stable temperature is reached, it will continue that stable temperature as long as I have vapor and liquid. It is going to be putting off a mass amount of BTUs. British thermal units is what we measure heat energy in. And at that point, it will keep liquefying. It will keep liquefying. We will get more and more liquid, which is simulated by the solid red and less and less vapor, which is simulated by the dots. All the way through this, we will be creating more and more liquid refrigerant. You can tell how well your condenser is operating by the point at which this temperature starts to drop again. At the very end of this condenser, we should be pure liquid, no vapor. Once we have hit that pure liquid, no vapor stage, that tells me we are doing what's called subcooling. Just like we talked about superheat is within relation to the boiling point, subcooling is in relationship to the boiling point, but it is below boiling point. So we are all liquid and we are now lowering the temperature even colder than boiling point. The more heat I take out of the refrigerant in the condenser, the more heat I can take into the refrigerant later in the evaporator and the better my system works. So coming out of the condenser is all high pressure subcool liquid. We then go into our next component, which is my receiver dryer. My receiver dryer, just like its name is two parts, it has two parts as well.
The first part of my receiver is the fact that it's a storage tank. It should store only liquid refrigerant. If you look, it even has a pickup tube inside of it to where all it can pick up is liquid refrigerant. Its goal is to only feed liquid out. If it's feeding vapor out, it is not going to absorb as much heat on the evaporator side. The second purpose is, is any moisture inside my system, such as in water in the air, humidity, is bad for my system and will not operate well. So at that point, it also has a desiccant element in it, and that desiccant is very hydroscopic. It absorbs moisture very readily. And it'll take that moisture out, trap it, and hold it. My, ref my uh, receiver dryer has a couple of side components on it. It can have a sight glass, so I can see what type of refrigerants are leaving. It can also have a moisture indicator. So I know how much moisture that desiccant is absorbed and when it needs serviced or replaced. This is one of our most common parts in replacing. Any work we do on the AC system, anytime this system is open, this component should be replaced. Now coming out of our receiver dryer, like we already said, its goal is to send out a pure liquid. We want nothing but high pressure liquid. This is going to be warm as far as it is over our body temp, so if we fill it, it will be warm, but it should by no means be hot. This is just a high pressure subcooled liquid. Should be very smooth, very equal, temperature coming out. We will then feed up and we will finally get to our first component by most people's listings, which is my TXV. This is my thermal expansion valve, sometimes called a thermastic expansion valve. Most mechanics will frame this, phrase this as a TXV. I have an old-fashioned style TXV pictured here. This could be an H-block TXV, such as in the Chrysler style, or what's commonly used on most trucks today. TXV is just a, a type of valve that's going to control refrigerant flow. Now we talked about the compressor creates flow. We talked about this being high pressure. To actually generate pressure, I have to have a restriction. And this is where that restriction begins. If you look, we do not have a very large opening inside the TXV. It's actually very narrow, very tight. So what happens here is pressure builds up. After it goes through the restriction, we are a low pressure because we now have room for our refrigerant to expand. Hence the term thermal expansion valve. At that point, when our pressure drops, our boiling point drops. Boiling point is in direct correlation with pressure. No different than water is, is 212 at sea level. At, at 8,000 foot, it drops down to a roughly 194 degrees. If I dropped water into a vacuum inside of this room at 80 degrees and put it at about a 27 inches of water or a mercury vacuum, it would boil at about room temperature. Our refrigerant's no different. Because of this drastic pressure drop, literally from about 220 PSI, 230 PSI, as high as 300 PSI, down to a 20 PSI, 30 PSI range, our temperature drops as well. If we were to put our hand on this line coming out of the expansion valve, number or letter A here, we would feel it and it would be very cold. We could even end up sticking to this. Any moisture on the line, any moisture in our fingers would literally freeze to that line. Now our expansion valve normally is attached right to our evaporator, which we'll talk about in a second. This system is laid out a little differently and you'll understand why in the end. It's to help us understand and remember it. But coming out of our expansion valve is almost all low pressure subcooled liquid. Our pressure is very low now. And at that point, we can even have a little bit of what's called flash gas. When that pressure very first drops, 
we can have a little bit of that liquid absorb the BTUs around it and boil. That's okay, that's normal in a system. Our goal is to keep flash gas down to a minimum. That's why when you start working on your AC system, you're gonna find this line and this expansion valve often insulated. It'll help prevent some of that flash gas and make it more efficient. When this actually comes to our evaporator, letter B here, it, is, it is, should be a low pressure subcooled liquid. We call it a saturated mixture because we'll have a little bit of flash gas occur. That's normal, that's okay, and it happens. But when we hit this, this evaporator, we should be absorbing BTUs. This is the cab air flowing through my evaporator. And as those BTUs are absorbed, I'm gonna see my temperature come up to where my refrigerant starts to boil. We should go from a subcooled liquid up to a saturated temperature. And that is my boiling point. I should see that temperature hold pretty steady throughout, throughout my AC system. And it should start boiling off my refrigerant. I will see a temperature hold. If I was able to measure the temperature, I will see that temperature hold throughout the evaporator as long as I have both liquid and vapor together. Now by the time this is done, I want to be pure vapor. If you remember what I said about the compressor, the compressor is there to move vaporized refrigerant. If we don't vaporize all the refrigerant through the evaporator, that liquid refrigerant can hit my compressor and at that point it could ruin it. Often when a system has first been serviced, if we charge it too quickly and do not charge on the proper side of the system, that's what they call slugging a compressor. I send a slug of liquid into it and I can destroy even a brand new compressor. So my goal is for this to be pure vapor coming out. Now an AC system works in many different conditions. We could be in Florida and be 80 degrees in November. We could be up in Colorado right now and be 35 degrees. And the question is, is why would you ever run your AC system if it's 35 degrees outside? Well, our AC system also runs with our defrost. So we have to have a way to regulate the flow of refrigerant based on the actual temperature of the system. Hence, the thermastic expansion valve. Our thermal expansion valve is going to measure the temperature of the refrigerant to control the flow of the refrigerant. It is going to utilize the thermal bulb to do this. Now this could be an H-block style of expansion valve where it just feeds this hose back through and internally it measures it. This can be an old Ford style expansion valve or a modern uh, uh, GM style expansion valve with an external thermal bulb. And it has its own refrigerant charge inside of here that is not part of my system. If this refrigerant charge escapes, we have no choice but to buy a new component. It's not rechargeable and it's not in any way open to the flow of refrigerant. And that thermal bulb attaches to the power head of that expansion valve. It is measuring the superheat of the tailpipe of my evaporator. By monitoring this tailpipe temperature, it is going to control the quantity of refrigerant flowing. The higher the tailpipe temperature, the further the expansion valve will open. The colder the tailpipe temperature, such as in I may even still have liquid, the further this closes down and the more it restricts the flow. So my spring is closing, my power head is opening. I do have a balancing line internally. For most of us in the AC work, that's not that important. We talk about that more in refrigeration. But at that point, my thermal bulb is there 
to help establish the proper flow, the proper quantity of refrigerant. Which will then, from there, my tailpipe will feed back to the suction side of my compressor, completing my flow. Now in this, in this system, it is a very simple setup. If you look, our colors are fairly well laid out. The reason this diagram is drawn this way, and you'll see so many of them drawn this way, is to help us remember this flow. If I was to take a line and draw across the center of this, you'll notice all my hoses are blue below the line, all my hoses are red above the line. At that point, all my components that are listed on the bottom section should be low pressure or cold. All my components above should be high pressure or red. So as I'm going through and doing a touch test on a system, this helps me remember what the different areas should feel like as I touch the lines. If you also notice, my hoses to one side is dotted. The other side, my hoses are solid. If I draw a line the other direction across my system, I now have a, high, a superheated vapor on one side and a subcooled liquid on the other. So if we take our diagram, we can label this very simply. Above the line, we said is high pressure, and it is a superheated vapor. This side is high pressure and is a subcooled liquid. We drop below the line. I'm a low pressure, subcool liquid. Into this side of the line, I'm a low pressure, superheated vapor. At this point, we have the basics of how you can troubleshoot your, your AC system. Understanding what happens to the refrigerant inside of it, understanding what should be going on inside the system, the basic flows. We can take this at a later time look at the components and go with a basic touch test. Now that we're out in the shop, we can look at the components we just got done diagramming and we can follow the same flow but on the vehicle. If we look, the compressor that creates the flow of, of vapor refrigerant is right here driven by belt with an electrical clutch. The condenser that takes the, the vapor refrigerant and converts it to a liquid refrigerant is right here. The receiver dryer that stores and ensures liquid refrigerant is all that's moving on is right up here. The side glass is up on the top of it. It then flows through inside to the cab. And so here we can see where our lines flow in from the through the firewall. Behind this ball of what's called live rubber, it's insulation, is our expansion valve. This is an H-block style expansion valve. From this expansion valve, we then flow into the evaporator. Back through the expansion valve where it picks it up for the thermal bulb and back out to the compressor. That completes our entire flow that we diagrammed on the board in the classroom. Thank you, and once again, I'm Corey Jones from Jones Technical Institute, and please check us out on our, on our JTEC YouTube JTEC is a technical school here in Jacksonville, Florida. We teach commercial truck driving, heavy duty truck, and automotive technology. JTEC and Napa have built a great relationship, and part of that relationship is they bring people by, like Ron Caps and NHRA, to sign autographs and everything. And that's what we're doing today to showcase the campus, you know, take tours for everybody, let them walk through and see what we're doing. To have a school like this, when I was growing up, would have been a dream. The facility is remarkable. All of the opportunities they have here with this facility, along with training truck drivers, what a great opportunity. Beautiful facility, top of the line, everything, everywhere. It's a uh, first class facility. 
uh, state of the art with some very impressive uh, people. It's been great meeting everybody here this morning. Napa's role in the school is a strategic partner with JTEC to educate uh, students in teaching the automotive trade. It's exciting for me to be associated with, with JTEC and everything that Napa's doing with Carlisle Tools. Napa's a great sponsor, great company. Well, right now, the, the automotive side of it, vehicles are changing on a monthly basis. So if you want to get in the automotive or any kind of technical field, you really have to go back to school. The, the technology has just advanced so far that you have to go back to school to be able to do these fields successfully. Have people come right out of high school, get an education, and, uh, and, and really go to work uh, and make a great living. If you want to start your own business, you want to go to work for a, an auto care center, you want to go to work maybe your own garage, maybe you want to go work on a race team, the sky's the limit at JTEC.